Tonight's lecture is, <laughs> I hate to say it, about myself um, and, my, and my journey in the chess world and what it is I personally found so exciting and interesting about the world of chess. Of course, when I got started in, in the world of chess, I didn't know anything about the history of the game, nor the chess sets, nor score sheets, tournaments, or any of that. Uh, the reason for my interest in chess really starts with Robert James Fisher, Bobby Fisher. It was 1972, I was 12 years old, when uh, chess came into my life. And uh, about that period of time, Bobby Fischer was playing against the evil Soviet Union's uh, Boris Spassky. And uh, the, it's really, really, really hard to recapture the excitement of that period. I mean, they even called it Fischer mania. Uh, there was a, a worldwide coverage. Uh, and I think, seriously, for the better part of two months, um, Bobby was front page coverage. Not even before the match had started, uh, he was already front page coverage because he was having a very hard time getting Bobby to Reykjavik, uh, Iceland, where the match took place. And there was a great deal of speculation he just wasn't going to make it. So uh, to really understand what was going on, uh, I strongly suggest you see the movie uh, Bobby Fischer versus the rest of the world because there you can see the archives and what it, what it all meant. It was, again, front page uh, coverage for the better part of two months. And I just got caught up in that excitement. I just thought that this was the coolest thing, you know, an American playing for the world championship and stuff. And uh, going back more personally to my life, 1972, I was 12. And basically, I was a good kid. I mean, no, I was a good kid. I was really good, you know. And one of the things I really loved to do was sleep. No problem. My parents said to me, you know, 7.30, time to go to bed. No arguments. I just went to bed. Oh, it was just great. And I recall this very vividly because it made a very strong impression upon me is for some reason, we had gone to a party as a family, and the point was it was past my bedtime. Suddenly it was like 8 o'clock, you know, let's get out of here, people, and 9 o'clock, and 10 o'clock, and somewhere around 11, uh, we made our departure. And we were going home, and as we got home, we did what? Most Americans do, you know, they turn on the lights, they turn on the TV, <laughs> and I was just making a beeline straight to bed. And really, it's, it's really ironic. Uh, in turning on the TV, um, it was a Johnny Carson show. And I didn't really care. I didn't even know who Johnny Carson was. I was just going to bed, and he says, welcome, welcome, welcome. We have a very special guest star this evening. We have world champion Bobby Fischer. <laughs> you know, I, I do a U-turn immediately, you know, wait for the commercial break, waiting for Bobby Fisher to come on. So Bobby comes on, and there he is, a standing ovation. Everybody's very, very excited about world champion Bobby Fisher. And he answers all of the normal questions in the most positive light you possibly can imagine. He's going to you know, hold, hold the world championship for the next 10 years. He's going to play in all the greatest tournaments. He's going to raise the prestige of chess. chess. Chess grandmasters are going to be the new sports stars. America is going to wake up to the world of chess. And I was like, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> Suddenly the show was over. Darn it. And I recall this very vividly, turning to my mom, and say, now at this point, you got to understand, I'm a real beginner. I mean, you know, just really, really rank. And I recall turning to my mom and saying, Mom, I have a question. She says, yes, son. I says, how can he call himself world champion? He never beat me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we got to write to somebody. We'll write to the mayor, the governor. Good, good, good. I'll go to bed. Okay. <laughs> 
So that was uh, really how I got caught up in the web of chess and the chess hoopla, the chess excitement. And again, it was just such a period of great, great excitement that I'll stay with it for a moment and I'll come back to how my chess career developed and stuff, but I want to stay with some Bobby Fischer stories. So there we were in the years 1973, 1974, 1975. We're all, you know, at the chess club, at the coffee shop, you know, awaiting the return of Bobby Fischer back to the, uh, the, the stage, so to speak. And a lot, a lot, a lot of stories were published about Bobby. He was with the Gardner, Ted Gardner's World Worldwide Church of God. It was a religious sect uh, of Christianity that believed, you know, Armageddon was like happening soon and only, you know, members of that particular church were going to be saved and it was pretty doomsday kind of cult and how that church was r running Bobby's life and how Bobby was turning down multi-million dollar endorsement commercial deals like every rumor that was ever circulated like I became instantly aware of and this is before the internet you know <laughs> so you got to understand there was a lot of stuff going on and there was like uh, Bobby turned down a million dollars from Johnson & Johnson for baby shampoo like do a commercial get a million dollars for baby shampoo and the point was, was, well, why did you turn down the million dollars? He says, well, I don't use baby shampoo. <laughs> I don't know if it's good. I can't, I can't tell everybody to go out and buy it. You know, I don't use, I don't have a baby. So, <laughs> like, these are, the, I mean, this is, these types of stories were incredibly, incredibly common. And they had us just in a tizzy because we couldn't believe that anybody would turn down a million dollars. And keep in mind, these are 1972 dollars. Today, uh, they use the word billion, and it would be just as outlandish as it was to use a million. And as, the, the, as time progressed to 1975, Bobby had to defend his championship title. In those years, the championships occurred in a three-year cycle. So by the third year of 1975, Bobby was due to play, in this case, Anatoly Karpov, the new Soviet superstar and challenger. And in those days, Ferdinand Marcos was the president of the Philippines, and he had offered five million dollars for the World Championship match to be played in Manila. Again, this is really, really was an outlandish sum of money. Uh, let's go back to 1972. In 1972, uh, the World Championship match, the bidding started at $100,000. 100,000 American dollars, I meant to say. And there was a contest for the bid between the cities of um, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, Reykjavik, Iceland, and the prize fund went up, up to $125,000. 125% above the minimum requested amounts. If you go back to the match that was held in 1969, between Tigran Petrosian and Boris Baski, I believe they played for a sum of 20,000 rubles. Mm -hmm. So you went from 20,000 rubles to $125,000. We'll stay at the figure for $125,000 for a second because I'd started with my lecture like, would Bobby even play? And Bobby basically said, no, 125,000, not enough, not enough. Uh, I want double that amount. And everybody was angry with Bobby Fischer, most especially the FIDE. Uh, at that time, the president of the FIDE was a fellow by the name of Max Irva. Max Irva, as you may know, was a former world champion holding the post. And Max Irva had worked very, very hard 
to get the two bidders to raise their bids to $125,000. He was patting himself on the back for a job well done. There's Bobby Fischer saying, double it, I ain't playing. So people were upset with Bobby. So there was a fellow, a philanthropist from the UK, his name was Jim Slater. He said, okay, put up or shut up. I'll double the prize fund. I'll double the prize fund. Now you, Bobby, come and sit down and play. Bobby went to Iceland and nearly forfeited the match. <laughs> That's another story. So again, you've kind of got to put it in perspective of 20,000 rubles, $125,000, doubled at the very, very last moment. I mean last moment to 250, a quarter of a million dollars. This had the chess world in a tizzy. By 1974, late 74, when the bidding for the match was <coughs> going to be taking place, Manila announced there's no reason for anybody else to bid against us. We're putting up five million, right? Whoa, we were just like, oh man, this is the greatest thing, you know, like, oh, they're gonna play a match. Bobby's gonna come back on the world stage. This is so cool, this is so cool. There's no way that Bobby's going to turn down five million. And there was a way. <laughs> Bobby wanted ch to change the rules of the World Championship. In those days, it was very simple. You played a 24-game match. If the World Champion scored 12 points, he was going to retain his title. Whichever player scored more than 12 points, meaning specifically 12 and a half or higher, they're going to win the match. Bobby said that the original match for the World Championship, Steinitz Blackburn, 1886 or so, uh, was the first to win 10 games. First to win 10 games, draws were not counted. It was only victories and losses that were counted. And uh, he wanted the first to win 10 games, which meant that the match could be an open-ended affair and literally, theoretically at least, be played for months and months and months and months and months. The Soviets objected and said 24 games is a sufficient number. And it all came down to a vote in the FIDE. The FIDE was the world and is the World Chess Federation. And as a political body, it was very similar to the United Nations. That was the time of the communism and socialism in Europe. And essentially, in the General Assembly of the United Nations, the Soviets had all the votes. There was a lot, a lot of times in the 70s that the US, especially where uh, resolutions about Israel were concerned, would routinely lose 150 to 3 objections. So having Bobby Fischer's rules changes decided by the uh, General Assembly of the FIDE, which again really resembled the Soviet votes, it was an, you know, Bobby is going to lose the vote. As it turned out, the United States Chess Federation and its delegates really, really uh, worked very, very hard and it came down to one vote in the Soviet's way and Bobby didn't get his way. It was one vote, just one vote. And Bobby lost the vote and the Soviets were all happy because they knew that Bobby was stubborn and if he didn't get his way, it was the highway. So almost immediately when the vote was tallied, Bobby uh, got the call that he had lost the vote. He had already prepared his statement and he forfeited his world championship title. He didn't play in Manila, and this less left us all like a, utterly agog. We couldn't believe it, you know, like, gosh, how could you turn down $5 million? Interesting enough, if you remember Ollie Frazier, uh, the thriller in Manila, well, that was the sporting event that picked up the $5 million that was on offer to Bobby Fischer, small world. Uh, one Bobby Fischer story I just absolutely had to share. This comes from the late 70s and a fellow by the name of Arnfried Pagal. Arnfried Pagal decided that he loved the Dutch team 
competitions, and he wanted his own team. So he created his own team called the Koenigs Club, the Koenigs Club, the King's Club. And he put his Dutch league, he put his team in the Dutch league, and there were like stages up the, the ladder till you get to the master class, and uh, he was, you know, wanting to become the champion of Holland. Well, some point in the late 70s, he got it in his mind that he wanted Bobby Fischer to play for his club in Holland. Cool. So how could he do that? So in those days, the idea was that Bobby would accept business offers and would meet, meet you in person for $5,000. Yeah, you, so that this, he used this as a kind of filter to avoid talking with people that he didn't want to talk to. And people who paid him $5,000, he kind of considered them serious. So uh, Arnfrey flew to Pasadena, the meeting was arranged, and they met at a restaurant. And the, as Arnfrey tells me the story, uh, it was going splendidly. Essentially what Arnfried wanted Bobby to do was to accept $100,000 to play a single game in the Dutch League. And because at that particular moment in time, the King's, the King's Club was like in the Dutch Fifth League. So the players were about 1,200 to 1,400. So Bobby is going to play a random 1,200 to 1,400 player. Exhibition game, one game, $100,000, and become an honor, honorary member of the King's Club. Well, this is a no-brainer, right? I mean, just, this is simple, this is simple. And Bobby started asking, well, is there going to be a gate? I beg your pardon? Are, pe are you going to sell tickets? Are people going to come to watch and do, do they have to buy a ticket? No, on the fifth league, <laughs> the Dutch team competitions, we don't charge people entry fee to watch the games. Okay, said Bobby, is it going to be filmed? Uh, filmed? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, is there going to be a, uh, a TV camera? Are you going to make a videotaping of the game? Well, no, I hadn't even thought about that. And Bobby just kept asking all these questions about different commercial rights. Will there be photographers? Yes, we're hoping for plenty of photographers. Well, are those photos going to be turned into posters? Posters? Yeah, are you going to sell posters of the event? No, you're just going to come and play a single game. You're going to get $100,000. I'm prepared to pay you $50,000 right now to sign this agreement. So this kind of went on, and Bobby says, gosh, this is so exciting to meet you, and it's so interesting. He says, let's have a second meeting tomorrow and discuss it further. Of course, said Arnfried. So 12, 24 hours later, a uh, second meeting comes up, and uh, Bobby has prepared like a list of like 35 questions. Like, and Arnfried just kind of like goes, chalks them off one, 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 one after another. And uh, Bobby's satisfied, but let's have a third day. Well, at this point, Arnfried starts to realize that something's wrong with the conversation because Bobby is is raising a whole host of questions he never even thought about, uh, much less had any intention. And now the agreement has to be all changed to be saying, we're not going to do posters, we're not going to do t-shirts, we're not going <laughs> uh, to exploit Bobby in a commercial fashion, and so forth and so on. What kind of pieces are we going to play with? You know, and all of these questions. Uh, what kind of chess clock are we using? So Bobby was very concerned about all of this, and Arnfried had a sudden realization. The realization that he had was Bobby's not going to accept. He can't figure out why, but Bobby is not going to accept the $100,000 offer. Arnfried's going to return to Amsterdam, and he's got absolutely no proof that he ever met with Bobby Fischer. So Arnfried decided that what he needed to do was hire a private investigator, 
so the guy could take a photo of them so that Arnfried could go back to Amsterdam and say, I met Bobby Fischer and this is my living proof. Okay, the third day that they were going to meet, they were going to meet a par in a park in Pasadena and they had been walking through this particular park and Bobby really had his favorite spot, a really beautiful uh, seating area with birds and da 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 da. So this was Bobby's favorite spot and they were going to meet at noon. So Pagal is there at noon and there's no Bobby. Bobby had been exceptionally punctual uh, in their meetings and so Arnfried instantly got w concerned like because Bobby should be there. Five minutes goes by, 10 minutes goes by, 15 minutes goes by, so still no Bobby Fisher. So now Arnfried's getting really concerned that he's in the wrong spot of the park. So he's doing his best at mapping and making sure that he's in the right spot. He's convinced he's in the right spot when he hears a psst over here. Well, he's looking around and there inside the trees and bushes is Bobby. Like, Bobby, what are you doing inside the trees? Come on out, says Arnfried. No, you come on in. <laughs> so Arnfried, you know, this German industrial has a suit and tie, you know, like scouting his way through the trees. And, and Bobby looks really panicked. He says, what's going on? He says, somebody's following me. So they have this bit of a conversation and Arnfried's looking around and Arnfried realizes that the private investigator he <laughs> hired had indeed been following Bobby Fisher. Bobby realized he was being followed and was now panicked and paranoid that somebody was following him. Just a classic, classic, classic tale. Uh, it was just very, very funny. I just love that. And there's so many Bobby Fisher stories that won't be the lecture this evening. We'll go back in time now, back to myself. And we'll talk a little bit about how I got interested in chess. I've already told you what the, the big stimulant was, was Bobby. And one of the things, again, as a 12-year-old, 12-year-olds are very interesting. In the world that we ha inhabit, uh, we have prodigies in lots of fields. Mathematics, art, music. These prodigies appear as well as in chess. We don't really have prodigies in literacy, which is interesting, literature, pardon me, in terms of uh, writers of a very young age. And in those days when I was starting chess, I was seeking an identity. As a 12-year-old, where do I fit in? You know, I understood in terms of the family unit where I was, but in terms of the adult world, well, I was still so young. I'm 12. Right? I'm 12 years old. Like, adults don't care about 12 year olds. But as I was playing chess, suddenly adults are, are caring about 12 year old and they say, hey, this kid's doing really great. And it was for me, I was a, the adult world opened up as I was becoming a chess player and a class player. Uh, they were giving me respect and, teach, uh, and treating me like a colleague. So this was very, very attractive to me, that I could sit in a group of adults, they could have conversations about President Nixon, Vietnam War, and wouldn't mind that I'm the fly on the wall because I had the respect I was a chess player. And this was a very, very powerful reason that I was hooked into the world of chess because I found the people also very interesting. So very, very deep friendships, friendships that I'm proud to say that I have today, were developed as I started playing chess. One of my, uh, uh, I had two best men at my wedding. Uh, one of them is John Donaldson. In 1973, we were 13, we played in the, U in the Washington State Junior Championship in Walla Walla, Washington. And what happened was I started, all the, all the juniors were hosted at the house of the Allens, uh, who were the sponsors of the tournament. So all of these juniors are staying in the house uh, together. And I went on a tear at the start. Like, I was just like, first day, you know, 3-0, that type of thing. So the juniors uh, all thought to themselves, well, how are we going to slow Yaz down? 
So they came up with a nifty idea. I could give them great points for creativity. They took my pillow and they put it in a freezer. Okay. <laughs> now, this is the weirdest thing. You know, like if ever you crawl into bed and you got a frozen feather down pillow, <laughs> it makes a very strange squishy sound <laughs> when your head hits the pillow. I, unless you've experienced it, and few of us ever have, uh, <laughs> I would suggest that that's like something very, very special. It worked. Uh, it slowed me down. And I don't really remember. Maybe I tied for, for second or something in that tournament. But that was like one of the next things that was really pulled me into the world of chess is I, of course, was raised in Seattle, Washington, which is <laughs> about as far away in those days as you could get from the epicenter of the world of chess. The epicenter was New York City. That was where, you know, Manhattan, the chess capital of America was, was there. And if you look at Seattle, well, <laughs> we're on the other side and close to Alaska. So I was really, really far from the world of chess. But amongst the community in Seattle, we had a kind of a thriving little chess thing going on. And there was a lot of chess activity, again, uh, most likely because of Bobby Fisher. And a group of us, friends, would travel by car to Vancouver, uh, BC, or down to Portland, Oregon, or over to Boise, Idaho, or the east side of uh, Washington State. And we traveled often together as we were all, you know, youngsters uh, trying to save a dime, you know, just pooling our resources together. So we would share cars and, uh, you know, we try to fit five, six per persons in the car. And I remember this. I just told Ben the story this afternoon because I was preparing for a lecture. <clears throat> The story goes, I'd gone down to Portland with a group of guys. There's about six of us in the car, so we're all kind of squeezed together. And, you know, it's a two and a half hour drive from Portland to Seattle. And we're somewhere between like Lacey, Washington, and, Ori and Olympic, Olympia, Olympia, Washington. And everybody did lousy in the tournament. You know, we lost, you know, like everybody, strangely enough, everybody in the car was in a position to win money if we had won our last game. Every single person in the car had lost the last round. So we're all like really, really quiet. Nobody's saying nothing. There's no partying. There's no hollering. Nothing. Quiet. Hence, the radio. It's very important that the radio's working. And somewhere between Lacey and Olympia, there was like no radio. That's it. We're stuck, man. So we're t changing the dial, trying to find any frequency, and there's a bang, you know, like really strong signal, like, man, like it was right there. Really strong signal of a country western station comes on. Cool. Now, nobody <laughs> liked country and western in the car, but it was better than silence, and so everybody left, uh, left the uh, song on. And man, I tell you, this was probably the single worst song I ever heard in my life. I mean, this was really, really awful song. Nobody touched the dial. In the meanwhile, my dear friend Leo, who was the other second best man at my wedding, said, guys, I'm feeling really, really ill. And then suddenly, and it happened really quickly, he pulled down the window and tossed his cookies. Ugh, oh. Bad, bad, bad scene. Everybody's handing him napkins and towels and doing everything to comfort him. In the meantime, this horrible song is dragging on. Uh, and just at that moment, the DJ comes on and he rips the needle across the record. You know that awful scratching sound? And the guy comes on and I said, God! Says, that was the worst song I ever heard in my life. Didn't, make, didn't it make you want to just throw up? <laughs> At that point, we had pulled the car over and like five chess players rolling out on the highway just holding their tummy with one chess player, Leo, Dr. David Leo Sefrak, you know, not saying a word. But those types of stories and those types of traveling experiences, you know, really, really help 
my chess career. Somehow, I'm not really too sure how, by 1974, two years later, I've become a class player. I think I'm about mm, maybe A at this point in my life, 1900 or so. And I'm going to Meany Middle School in uh, Seattle, Washington, public school, inner city public school. I mean, it was Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition. That was, uh, that's Meany Middle School. And uh, I'm in the class, and a kid comes to class and says, yes, sir, Sarah, one has to report to the principal's office. I'm like, oh, they found out what I did. What did I do? What did I do? <laughs> so I'm trying to think, why am I being punished? And I'm thinking to myself, I, did, I, I was good that day. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. And anything that happened last week, well, the statute of limitations has expired. You, know, you can't punish me for something I did you know, 48 hours ago or, or longer. So I go to the principal's office, and he says to me, yes, sir, I understand you're a good chess player. Oh, no, 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 I'm not a good chess player. Oh, well, but you play chess. Yeah, yeah, I play chess. I'm not that good. He says, well, I would like you to teach a class here at Meany Middle School. So I have to kind of reflect on this for a moment because I have to suddenly switch and realize I'm not being punished. I'm going to be a teacher in the classroom. Yeah, we want to offer chess as an elective in the course next semester. Good grief, this is cool. Okay, I say to the principal, you know, you understand I'm going to give myself an A. And the, yeah, the principal said, yeah, I suspect you would. And I said, well, I'm going to give all the other kids an A as well. And he says, well, if they're deserving, I expect you would. I said, cool. And we'd have one adult to take uh, attendance, but otherwise everything's on me. So I was really, really happy with this. I mean, I, I thought this was really cool. And at the start, the very first day, there were seven kids in the class, seven I was really, really happy, and I started. Well, as you know, truancy, kids cutting classes, what have you. By the end of the class, there were 42 kids in my class. So in 1979, Grandmaster James Tarjan, he said, Yaz, come down and live with me in Hollywood, California. I'm going to go to the Soviet Union. I'm playing in the inner zonals. Uh, as we know, at that time, that was a preliminary tournament to get to the candidates' matches, and the candidates' matches brought you a challenger and so forth and so on. So Jim needed a sparring partner, a coach, a trainer. He invited me down to live with him for three months in Hollywood, California. I accepted. Uh, Jim, uh, in those days, had a bug, a VW bug, you know, a white car, and this car was a total jalopy. I mean, it was like a very, very, very sad looking car. I mean, it had rust spots in the right places and fender benders and the whole thing. I mean, this was a pathetic car. And I said, Jim, you need a new car. He says, I know, but this is the only car I know how to fix myself. I don't have to rely upon anybody. I can fix the bug. Okay, so our days really went like this. We would wake up more or less about noon. And Jim, who has a Hungarian background, made some of the best spaghetti sauces I've ever had in my life. And he'd make it in gallons. <laughs> <laughs> so these gallons lasted two, three, four days. And I'm telling you, on the third and fourth day, it was better than on day one. I mean, it just improved with age. We'd wake up in the morning, we'd cook some eggs, and we'd put spaghetti on it. Then, very quickly, we'd eat real fast, we'd get in this car, and drive down to Santa Monica and Venice Beach. So we'd drink these cappuccinos, and more or less, maybe by two or three, we got ourselves some Mexican food, great Mexican food. We go back, we'd study chess till like eight, nine o'clock, go to Hollywood, have dinner, usually watch some movies, some independence, and the days just repeat it day after day after day after day. Cool. All right. So it was one day, man, you know, like we skipped breakfast. We just decided to go to Venice Beach and, uh, you know, we're just kind of 
completely tired, sleeping, you know, in the car. And we're driving along, and I kind of look around, and I say, Hey, Jim, this is really cool, man. You cleaned the car. Jim's driving, you know, like, he's, what? I say, yeah, man, you cleaned the car. This is great. <laughs> he keeps driving, ignoring what I'm saying. And on the rearview mirror, there was hanging a chain. Um, and you open it up, and there's a, a photo. So I open this chain hanging. I open up the photo and say, well, who's the lady? Oh, we were in the wrong car. <laughs> we had to drive back as fast as we could to Hollywood. Now, in Hollywood, a parking spot is a premium. You get out of a parking spot in Hollywood, it's almost a, a certainty somebody's in 12 seconds behind you. Somehow, the parking spot that we had taken the car from was still available. We dropped off the car and we jumped out of the car, man. And we're looking at this white bug, and it was like a perfect replica of Jim's car. The rust spots were in the same area. The key worked perfectly. It was like, what is going on with this car? Oh, that was like amazing. I traveled in 1979 to Riga, Soviet Union, to the heart of communism, you know, the belly of the giant. And, uh, uh, you know, I had been trained in the American educational school, grow, grown up. We all knew it was better to be dead than red, you know. Like, I remember the drills, like when the nuclear blast comes, you know, you hide under your desk, you know, <laughs> like, this was great. So there I am in the heart of the communist giant, and there's this inner zonal tournament that's going to last six weeks. Six weeks, Jesus. So I'm at the tournament, man, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's what we were doing, chess, and uh, I go down to the bar at the hotel. We stayed at the Hotel Riga in Latvia, and I order a beer, right? I just want a beer. So the bartender gives me a Pilsner Urkel. And you may be familiar with it. If not, this particular beer comes from the Czech Republic, and it's like the finest lager in the world. This is great, great beer. Well, in those days, the Warsaw Pact nations, they didn't have trade between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And so the, the, the goods and services of those countries went east to Russia. So I had never had this Czech beer, man. And I'm drinking this. Jesus, this is like a great beer. How do I become communist? <laughs> you know, like, this beer is like really, really awesome. I mean, like, wow, I had no idea. If I had known that, you know, it'd be great. Uh, so lots of stories about that one. We'll continue. In the 70s, late 70s, there was a guy, his name is Lewis, was, pardon me, he passed, Lewis Statham. Do any of you know the name of Lewis Statham? In the chess world, he was n known because he sponsored tournaments in Lone Pine, California. There was a series of great, great tournaments in Lone Pine, California. And Louis Statham was a remarkable man, a Texan. He still had that twang uh, when I met and stayed with him. And uh, he was an inventor. He had about 200 patents by the time he passed. He was one, one of his original inventions was a kidney dialysis machine. Another invention he had was the underwater bomb. If you think about it, how do you get a bomb to explode underwater? Well, he figured it out. So he had patents, and his, his interests just were extraordinary. And I stayed with him uh, uh, during one particular event at the Lone Pine tournaments where all of these great, 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 great grandmasters came. And I recall it quite vividly. Uh, he had the most remarkable house. It, it was, it, Lone Pine, California is at the foot of Mount Whitney and really, really beautiful views of the mountain. He built like a 20,000 square foot home and it was all made out of like these woods, beautiful, beautiful redwoods and everything was at a 90 degree angle. And it was an extraordinary house, hardwood floors throughout. And if you wore athletic socks and you got a good run, you could slide, baby. I mean, seriously slide across these floors. So uh, uh, Louis made it clear at 9 o'clock breakfast. I had to be there at 9 o'clock. And of course, I'm late. 
and I'm coming down this winding staircase and it's wood and the staircase you know like you got a really long step that kind of goes in at a 90 degree angle so in, when you're on the outside of the stairs you're really like in a cartoon my leg <laughs> like this so I came down these stairs really fast and went wham right up against the wall there was a picture here and my hands hit the wall and I missed the picture by about that much just an inch or two I did a circle go flying down this hall and I must have slid about 70 feet past the breakfast room, right? Did a turn, come sliding into the breakfast room, into my seat, and there's Louie in his jumpsuit. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, yeah, as I kind of heard you coming down the stairs. Yeah, that's right. He says, well, the bottom of the stairs is a painting. You didn't by chance hit the painting, did you? No, missed it by that much. So that's a good thing. And I said, why, Louis? He says, well, it is Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, and I'm not kidding, that Rembrandt was like two feet to the left. <laughs> the world of chess has always had sponsors like Rex and Jeannie, and Louis is in a long line of really wonderful sponsors, and I loved him for it. One of the stories of the Lone Pine events was that the Soviets boycotted America. We, you know, like it was very hard for Soviet players to come to the U.S. and vice versa, visas, blah, blah, blah. In short, we didn't have too many exchanges of people. But Tigran Petrosian and <coughs> Vasily Smyslov came to Lone Pine, California. Wow, two former world champions playing on American soil. It was really, really cool. And I was a big, big admirer of Tigran and Petrosi. And it was the strangest thing. In the games that I was playing, sometimes during the game, I had this feeling that there was a presence behind me. And it was like the weirdest thing. When I had that feeling, when like, I turn around and there was Petrosian looking at my game. Now, I would go and look at his game, which I found remarkably interesting, but I didn't find my <laughs> games as interesting as he seemed to find the game. I say that as a prelude to the story that I'm about to tell. It was a free day. And in the, in the playing hall, there was an analysis room. Well, so there's a playing hall, and there's this analysis room. And Don Miguel Nydorf, how many of you know the name of Miguel Nydorf? Okay, he's holding court. He's basically 70 years old. And he's playing this, this whole line of American juniors and just killing them one after the other. <laughs> you know, like just bang, bang, bang. And every time he won, he would be hollering really loudly, blood, I need blood. You are too young for me, blood. You know? <laughs> and he was just killing these juniors, swatting them like flies. So eventually, I got pushed into the line, and I didn't really want to play Miguel. That wasn't the way I was going to spend my afternoon uh, on the free day. I got pushed into this line, and I, I'm about to play Don Miguel. We're setting up the pieces when he gets a tap on the shoulder. And he turns, he does a double take, and it's Tigran Petrosian. He wants his, and Miguel spoke perfect Russian. They, uh, Miguel instantly offered Tigran Petrosian his seat. So Petrosian sat down opposite me, and I thought he wanted the set, so I kind of stood up because what's going on here? And he goes, sit down, sit down. And he just starts setting, and he starts the clock for five minutes. Holy cow, I couldn't believe it. You know, I get to play one of my chess heroes a five minute game. How cool is that? So. We started the game, and I recall much of the game, not exactly everything, and it was like I was possessed. Something, some force took over my body, and I really played an extraordinary game, and I absolutely crushed him. Oh, sorry, I meant to, I, 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 I did it wrong. When Petrosian sat down, it was like an instant uh, clarion call, and all of the grandmasters and all of the players who were playing in Lone Pine literally rushed into this room that was probably smaller than this and probably held three times as many people as is in this room. 
And in the background, there was six-time U.S. chess champion Walter Brown, and he shouts, 50-50 on Sarah One. What are my bets? <laughs> and uh, uh, I win. I win the game. So I get up, so the next junior can play in Petrosian. <laughs> you know, you, you sit down. So at this point, Vasily Smyslov comes over to Tigran and he kind of holds him in his arms and he's talking to him in Russian. And the scuttlebutt was that Smyslov was saying, listen, the gloves can come off. <laughs> you know, this kid's really strong. Again, I'm black. I play this beautiful, beautiful game. I completely crush Petrosian. I can't believe it. I mean, I really, really can't believe it. And the silence was so deafening, it was almost painful. And it lasted an extraordinarily long time, like 30 seconds. Nobody moved, nobody breathed, nobody said anything. And this voice comes out, three to one, four, sir, one, who's going to take the bet, you know? <laughs> Making a long story short, the real Mr. Serwan showed up for games three and four, and as he tied the match two to two, Tigran Petrosian shook my hand. And that, for me, was just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful moment, and I thank Louis Statham for making it possible. We're going to go really fast, fast forward here, because I did want to tell a couple of stories. The first one is, you know, like, okay, at this point, uh, I was 19. It's 1980. Uh, I'm in Zee, Vikonze, Holland, and it's my first major event. I'm a rookie, and I'm playing in the big leagues. Uh, Victor Korchnoi, world number two player, behind Anatoly Karpov at that time, is playing in the tournament, Grandmasters Timon. It's a really top, top, top field, and I'm like one of the lowest rated players in the field. Okay. Long story short, I do really, really well. I beat Victor Korchnoi in our individual matchup game. I need to score something like seven and a half points to get my third and final Grandmaster Norm. I do this like in round eight out of a 13 round tournament, or, or round nine, uh, Goodman, against Grandmaster Goodman, there's Sigur Janssen, I have won, and that makes my Grandmaster Norms. Okay, so as soon as he resigned, the tournament organizers stopped all the clocks on the stage. Cool. And they brought out silver uh, uh, trays with magnum champagne. And they poured all of these glasses for the players on the stage to toast their new colleague. How cool was that, right? Like, I mean, a very, very proud moment. And there was a turkey butt. He was playing in, the, uh, in, in one of the sections, like the parliament group. He was complaining because his opponent had illegally done something and punched the clock. So he happened to be on stage talking to the chief arbiter at the time. And so, you know, like, could he get some minutes or penalize the opponent or something like that? And that guy, his name is Jan Nagel. And Jan got a, a, a glass of champagne. And so he just happened to be standing in the right place at the right time. That guy became my future father-in-law, <laughs> OK? So I say, ever since we first met, Jan has been on my account. <laughs> and I pay for his drinks. Yeah. <laughs> so, at the end of the tournament in Vikonze, Viktor Korchnoi, again, the world number two player by rating, he, uh, a Soviet dissident who had now made his home in Zurich, Switzerland, he came to me after the game and he says, yes, sir, there's something I'd like to ask you. I said, sure. He says, uh, how would you like to be my trainer? I couldn't answer because uh, several, so many thoughts were going through my mind, but I remember most clearly what I was thinking. Could I afford it? In other words, how much do I have to play Victor so that we could train together, right? And he totally misunderstood my silence. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I'll pay you 500 Swiss francs a, a week. 
and I will pay all your travel and hotel expenses and meals and da 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 da. And it suddenly occurred to me that he was going to pay me to train him. <laughs> I was like, okay, I accept, you know, <laughs> thank you very much. And two months later, in March of 1980, I have traveled to Zurich. And it's a long flight, Seattle to Zurich in 1980. Let me tell you, you do a lot of transiting. It's like Seattle, Denver, Denver, New York, New York, London, London, Zurich. Ooh, with lots of hours in between. And uh, Petra, uh, at that time, his assistant, had just prepared a beautiful dinner. Victor and I have this beautiful dinner together. And we're chit-chatting till like 11 p.m. at night, right? And uh, finally, 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 uh, Victor says, oh, Jesus, you must be on jet lag hour. I'm so sorry, 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 sorry. Go to bed, go to bed. We'll wake up at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and start training. It's like, what? You know, 8 o'clock, no chance. Um, yeah, go to bed, go to bed. So I'm saying, fine. And I'm going to the guest room. And he's going into the guest room. And I'm saying, Victor, what are you doing? That's my, my bed. He says, no, 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 no. You stay in the master bedroom. Sleep in the master bedroom. He says, no, 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 please, please, Victor. I'm so happy to be here. I, 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 I'm, the guest room is perfect for me. He says, no, no, no. I insist you go into the master. No, 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 no. So this goes back and forth. And then he says to me, look, I've actually got a bad back. I go, yeah. He says, Petra got for me this ultra firm mattress in the uh, 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 master bedroom. When I sleep, he, I sleep in the guest room. So, you, so I said to him, well, you'll be, I'll be doing you a favor if I sleep in the master, guest, uh, master room. And he says, yeah. I said, OK, in that case, cool. I'll go and sleep in the master bedroom. We're saying our final good nights, and as he's shutting the door, and he says to me, and by the way, I hope you're not nervous, and closes the door. And I'm 20 years old, man, and life is good. What on earth should I be nervous about? And Victor's English at the time wasn't so great, and sometimes he mispronounced things. And like a dummy, I should have just knocked on the door and said, what do you mean by that comment? But I didn't. I was going to use my Sherlock Holmes brilliance. Through deductive reasoning, I could figure out what Victor meant with his comment. So I go to bed that night, and it's like a riddle. And I think, 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 I can't come up with anything. Two weeks later, we have spent an enormous amount of time together, literally 12 hours a day every day for two weeks in a row, and I'm getting to know Victor a lot, lot better. And Victor, at the time of Victor's defection, it was a serious blow to the USSR Chess Federation, a very, very serious blow. And Victor thought of himself as an extremely important person uh, who had shamed and embarrassed the Soviet Union. And during these two weeks, he made it very, very clear to me that he was absolutely, absolutely certain that one day he was going to be assassinated, that the KGB was going to kill him. And what Victor meant was if it was going to be that night that they'd send an assassin, the KGB hitman wasn't going to shoot the guy in the guest room. He's going to shoot the guy in the master bedroom, right? <laughs> I became nervous. 